Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Weistuck. I'm the interim executive director of the Skirball program. And I would like to welcome you this evening to uh, what uh, promises to be a very exciting uh, partnership between uh, the Skirball Center and uh, JPS, the Jewish Publication Society. Um, uh, jointly, uh, we will be offering lectures uh, featuring uh, the scholars who have recently published uh, uh, works through JPS. And um, as you may uh, have gathered, if you've uh, picked up one of, our, one of the brochures here, uh, upcoming in, in this uh, fall semester, uh, we have two uh, additional scholars in addition to Rabbi Salkin, uh, James Kugel and uh, Dr. Lawrence Schiffman, uh, who will be talking about their participation, their con contributions uh, to a, uh, a major work uh, dealing with um, uh, write, Jewish writings uh, that are outside of the, uh, the canon. And uh, this is a, uh, an incredible uh, compendium of uh, works, uh, newly translated, as well as commentaries. Uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Kugel will be speaking on Jubilees uh, and the apocryphal literature. And uh, Dr. Schiffman will be speaking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, yes, uh, the dates are November 21st for uh, Dr. Kugel and uh, December 5th for uh, Dr. Schiffman. So uh, well, you're welcome to pick up one of these flyers on the table, uh, as well as uh, a catalog from uh, the Jewish Publication Society. And um, also uh, have a look at some of the other items on the table, uh, including the Skirball course guide for the fall. Uh, we've just, we're just concluding our first week of the fall semester. It's not too late to join a class if you wish to, uh, but also in the course guide, in the catalog, there are um, uh, there is a listing of the Sunday seminars that we will be holding. And uh, the next Sunday seminar on October 20th will feature our speaker for this evening, uh, Rabbi Salkin. And uh, that, will, uh, that um, uh, seminar will take place uh, at Temple Israel. And again, you're welcome to pick up one of the course guides that gives uh, more details about the course, which will be a, uh, an amplification of some of the material that uh, Rabbi Salkin is dealing with uh, this evening. So um, those are the commercial announcements. Um, and now I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Rabbi uh, Barry Schwartz, uh, the director of the Jewish Publication Society who will, in turn, introduce our speaker for this evening. And again, welcome. Thank you, Mark. OK. Erev Tov, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Barry Schwartz. For the past four years, I've been the head of the Jewish Publication Society in Philadelphia. However, I live right across the river in Leonia, New Jersey, just over the George Washington Bridge. And it's uh, my pleasure to be here for the, the first lecture of what we know is going to be an exciting partnership between the Jewish Publication Society and the Skirball Institute. We have some of the, if I may so myself, some of the world-class scholars in Bible and rabbinics that write for the Jewish Publication Society. This is a wonderful opportunity for them to come to New York to the Skirball Institute to speak about their new works with us and for an opportunity uh, to, to learn intimately with, uh, with some of these scholars. And it is indeed a pleasure that we're inaugurating uh, this series. We expect to have anywhere from, from one to three scholars speaking each semester. I'd really like to thank 
the entire team at the Skirball Institute for uh, arranging this, uh, beginning with Mark and continuing with his staff. I'd also like to introduce Sarah Siegel over there, who works for the Jewish Publication Society. Either Sarah or myself will be happy to answer um, any questions. Just out of curiosity, from this esteemed group, how many of you have previously heard of JPS, the Jewish Publication Society? Well, I'm glad. I'm glad because in some ways, I would describe JPS as the best kept uh, secret in the Jewish community for the last 125 years. And uh, that's a shame, but uh, you know, but many people don't know that the, the Bible that they read, the Tanakh that they read, and this is, this is a Temple Emmanuel copy that I will not take with me. I'll return it to the room down there. Good evening. Uh, is, uh, is the second tra great translation of the Jewish Publication Society. The first was in 1917. The second began in 1962, was completed in 1985. The translation of record for the Jewish community for the last 100 years has been that of the Jewish Publication Society. If you wonder what we're up to, what our uh, forthcoming publications are, please take uh, a catalog. Please peruse that. We have entered into a publishing partnership of our own that's given us a new lease on life. And we have many exciting projects, big and small, that will be published in the coming years by the Jewish Publication Society. So it's a delight and a pleasure to inaugurate this series with the first book uh, published this year by the Jewish Publication Society from my colleague and friend, Rabbi Jeff Salkin. You know, one of the beautiful things about my position is the opportunity to work closely with authors to help them develop the ideas and to guide them uh, through the publication process. And you become close to the authors and especially the, the rabbinic colleagues. And, and I can certainly say that for Rabbi uh, Jeffrey Salkin. Let me just read you a few words of, of background about him from his standard bio, and I'll add a few uh, words of my own, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to him. Rabbi Jeff Sulkin is a native of New York, and he was ordained at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in New York in 1981. He's just a little bit older and a little bit taller than myself, because I was ordained from the same New York campus in, in 1985. He was one of the first rabbis to receive the Doctor of Ministry degree from Princeton Theological Seminary in 1991. Ever since the publication of his first book, and you have probably heard of it, Putting God on the Guest List, How to Reclaim the Spiritual Meaning of Your Child's Bar or Bat Mitzvah, Rabbi Salkin has been known for his writing, his teaching, and his activism. Besides that subject of bar and bat mitzvah, his books have dealt with such varied topics as the spirituality of career, masculinity, Israel, righteous Gentiles, how the Torah speaks to teenagers, and the history of Jewish iconoclasm, which is the subject of his present book, the one we'll be talking about uh, this evening. Several of his books have won national awards. Rabbi Salkin is extremely active in writing essays that have been quoted in major periodicals throughout the country. He recently began and introduced me to a blog that he writes for the Jewish journal called Martini Judaism. You have to shake it up and pour it out. And I can tell you that this man's mind never stops. Rabbi Salkin, how many hours of sleep do you get a night? You'd be amazed that I actually get about eight hours. He gets about eight hours, but his mind, and that's very good, that's about two more than I get a night, but his mind must be you know, continually working because Every time you talk to this man, he has an interesting and provocative thought that he will express to you. We never have a short conversation about anything, even if he's on the road, because his mind is going, and he's one of the few colleagues who can translate his thinking into dynamic prose. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. But it's no surprise that 
Rabbi Jeffrey Sulkin's colleagues describe him as intellectually fearless and an activist for Jewish ideas, which is, uh, I don't know who coined that, which one of our colleagues, but it, it is absolutely true in terms of the kind of person that Rabbi Salkin is. He presently divides his time between writing, teaching, and serving as the spiritual leader of Temple Beth Am in Bayonne, New Jersey. I always believe in introducing authors by sharing a few of their words directly, because that gives you an idea of who they are. So permit me very briefly to quote from the beginning and end of the introduction to his book, because I think it will make you want to buy the book afterwards. We're offering that 25% discount, uh, because you, you will get a sense of his writing, and you will also, of course, be hearing his teaching um, style. <coughs> Rabbi Salkin says near the introduction, the beginning of his introduction, that when Abraham shattered the idols, the shattering never stopped. It has continued to reverberate down through the ages. Now, here's his imagination going. If we dare to imagine this as a movie, we would see the shattered pieces of idol morph into the shattered pieces of the tablets of the law that Moses broke at the golden calf. Then they would become the pieces of the shattered altars of both the first and second temples in Jerusalem. Then they would become the shattered primordial vessels of creation as the medieval mystic Isaac Luria imagined them. We would see pieces of broken glasses on the streets of Germany and Austria, the remnants of homes, businesses, and synagogues that were destroyed on Kristallnacht, the night of shattered glass in November 1938. Finally, those pieces of glass would magically become the pieces of countless glasses that Jewish grooms crush beneath their heels at every Jewish wedding, which is one of the rare items besides the reaction of restaurant patrons when a member of the wait staff drops a tray that an act of breaking elicits applause. So that's just one uh, piece from the beginning of his introduction and here from the end of the, the introduction. The gods are broken has one basic idea. All of Jewish history is a commentary on the legend of Abraham shattering the idols. We will enter the life and legacy of one Midrash and explore how that Midrash shaped Jewish consciousness over the millennia. We will look at that legend from every angle and through the eyes of all its characters. We will see how the legend developed over time, how this story might have become the primal trauma of Jewish history, how this legend continues to reverberate and even how this legend is connected to the phenomena of anti-Semitism, this story is not only big, it is also subversive, perhaps even dangerous. Understand this famous legend, and you will understand the Jews and all of subsequent Jewish history. We offer the tantalizing possibility that all of Jewish history is a midrash on this midrash which itself exists for only one reason, to help us answer the question, why did God choose Abraham? If we can discern why God chose Abraham, then we can discern why God chose the Jews. And if we can discern why God chose the Jews, we can figure out why Jewish existence is crucial to the spiritual survival of the world. Rabbi Jeff Salkin. Thank you, Barry. That was wonderful, and I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the ability to inaugurate this partnership by being able to teach from my new book, The Gods Are Broken, The Hidden Legacy of Abraham. I must say to you that I find it interesting and not a large coincidence that we gather to study what I believe to be one of the great texts of Jewish history, the week after we deal with the reality of the Pew Center study. For those of you who are interested, I actually wrote a song about the Pew Center study. 
and we just recorded it today. It's on YouTube. It'll be on YouTube tomorrow. It's called The Jews We Are a Changing, and it is in some ways an homage to Bob Dylan's The Times They Are a Changing, which was recorded exactly 50 years ago this month. I find it interesting that this book comes out at the same time as the Pew Center study because in large measure, I really think that what we are suffering from now, we American Jews, is not so much a loss of faith, but actually a loss of purpose. And that we are in many ways struggling to figure out why it is that there needs to be the Jews in the first place. I have to confess to you that as I looked through the study and as I thought about the study, I found myself pondering the fact that if tomorrow the Jews, God forbid, disappeared, not in a bloody way, but if we were all just kind of sucked into a vortex and put on another planet, what would the world be missing? Well, according to that study, the world would be missing a sense of humor, maybe a lot of Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> But I think there has to be something deeper. In fact, one of the beautiful things about the Skirball Center and its relationship with its host, this great congregation, is that this is a congregation that has stood in the forefront of life in the modern world and has itself, in time and over time, shattered some idols of Jewish history that have existed. More about that later. Isn't it interesting that when you really look at it, even though we are a faith and a people that cares so much about continuity, our people started with an act of discontinuity. And I think that's a wonderful paradox. I must confess to you that I have been thinking about this material for my entire life. But my concern with this material really is focused by the fact that a number of years ago I was discussing Judaism with a man who is now over the age of 90, and he told me that he didn't get much out of his Jewish education. And I asked him if he remembered anything, and he said, the only thing I remember was the first sentence in Hebrew that I learned in Cheder. And that sentence in Hebrew, which he could recite from memory, Avraham lo ha'amin bapsilim. Abraham did not believe in the idols. And I started thinking about why this story is so memory resident within the life of the Jewish community and the Jewish world. And what you have in front of you, my friends, is one of the most famous stories ever told in Jewish life. It is a story that is so famous that many of us actually think that it's in the Bible. And lucky you, this just happens to be the Torah portion for this week. Rabbi Davidson, it's nice to see you. Thank you for, thank you for being here and thank you for having me. Uh, I've known your rabbi for many, many years and uh, my affection for him and my respect for him and his family grows geometrically every year. The fact is that we tell this story about how Abraham broke his father's idols. How many of you know that story? It's probably the story that all of us grew up with. I will share with you the fact that the story, as I mentioned moments ago, does not appear in the Bible. In fact, if it was going to appear in the Bible, it would have appeared in the last verse or so of this past week's Torah portion when we finally meet Abram, whose name will be changed uh, to Avraham. So with the text that you have in front of you, let's start with the biblical text. By the way, I hope this will be a conversation, uh, and I hope that you will please take advantage of the opportunity to ask questions to insert your own comments. There are no stupid questions, and I hope the answers uh, will not be stupid either. And so we start with a biblical text. These are the generations of Terach. Terach fathered Avram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran fathered Lot. 
and Haran died, and now I insert the Hebrew that's used because this is really important. Al Pene, which is translated as in the lifetime of Terah, his father, in the land of his birth, in Ur Kazdim. Now let's unpack this a little bit. One of the things I love teaching is that the first 11 chapters of Genesis really should be called the book of God's disappointments. Because it shows that God, starting with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, undergoes a series of experiments with humanity and at each one he must do control alt delete. He has to reboot the humanity project. And so he gives Adam and Eve one commandment, one mitzvah, don't eat from the tree. And they blow it. The first commandment is a dietary law. And they're exiled. And then we have Cain and Abel, and Cain kills Abel. And then we go to Noah, and everything was fine. Uh, Noah saves his family and the animals, though you sometimes have to ask yourself, how righteous was Noah really? Uh, he didn't speak out or protest at all against what God was going to do. And then when that's all over, Noah gets drunk and one of his sons dishonors him, one of the great censored stories of the Bible. In fact, if you're free to come, uh, not this Sunday, but next Sunday when I talk about the primal trauma of Jewish history, we'll look at a psychoanalytical interpretation of what goes on in the book of Genesis and show how uh, our first family was, well, dysfunctional, to say the least. And then we go to the Tower of Babel, and by the time this is over, God is saying that, look, I, I've had it. I'm not going to be able to make the world perfect. So what I'm going to do is I've got three sons now. We've got Shem, Ham, and Yafet, the three sons of Noah. I'm going to focus on one son, which is Shem, and then I'm going to focus on one of those descendants will be Abram, and I'm going to make the Jewish people an experimental people, an avant-garde people, a light to the nations, one people with one land, with one city, and if they can get it right, then we can get the world right. That's Judaism on one foot. We rise for Elena. <laughs> That's about all I know. So what happens here is that we have our first family in Ur Kazdim, Ur of the Chaldeans. It's interesting, I was teaching in Columbus, Georgia, where I used to live in the State University there, teaching a class in Bible, teaching about Ur, and I had a couple of people in the class who were veterans of the Gulf War. One guy raised his hand and said, hey Rabbi, I got pictures from Ur. Ur is in Iraq. And Ur was the most sophisticated city of its time. It was New York, Paris, London, and Peoria, uh, well not Peoria, all wrapped in one. And so Terach takes his three sons and he leaves Ur going northwest through what we remember from grade school to be called the Fertile Crescent and they land in the city of Haran. Now this is very confusing. It's, if it's confusing to you, it's confusing to me, and I cannot tell you how many hours of sleep I lost making sure when I edited the manuscript that I made a distinction between Haran, Abraham's son, excuse me, uh, Terach's son, Abraham's older brother, and the city of Haran, which can be located somewhere in Turkey. Now what we read in the text is that they leave and that Haran died back in Ur. There were no Chaldeans then. That's, I said to my class in New Jersey the other day, that's like finding a Lenape Indian text and finding a reference to the Short Hills Mall. It's clearly, clearly wrong. But that's what the editor thought it was. And so Haran dies in the lifetime of his father, Terah. May God spare us all such tzuras. And then the family migrates north 
to Haran. And Terah stays there along with Nahor, the surviving brother. Now, Nahor, we need him because his line is going to produce Rebecca, right? And then Rachel and Leah. That's the old family homestead. In one of the chapters in this book, I try to develop a sympathetic view of Terah, and I wonder aloud, why is it that Terah stayed in Haran? And I developed a midrash about a guy named Harry who loses his son, Charlie. And Harry lived in Boynton Beach, and his kids live in New Jersey, and they say to him, Dad, you should come live with us. And so Harry packs up the car and he starts driving north from Boynton Beach, makes a pit stop uh, in Jupiter, and then again in Jacksonville, goes up 95, and he stops for dinner in Charleston. <coughs> and he has a nice dinner and he walks around and he discovers he really likes the place and he stays overnight. And then he calls his kids. He says, I really love Charleston. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to settle here. And they're scratching their heads and they're saying, we thought Dad was going to come and live with us in New Jersey. Why is he going to stay in Charleston? And then one of the kids who is psychologically somewhat sensitive says, well, you know, Charlie died. Dad's driving and he stops in Charleston. Do you think that it's the connection between the memory of Charles and the city of Charleston? Nah, nah. Well, so my theory, my playful theory, is that Tarah stays in Haran because it's only a little bit of scribal ink separate from the, the son he just lost, which is Haran. Yes, sir? Yeah, I mean, I don't know when you want to entertain questions. I'll entertain questions at any time. OK. I'll let you know it's All right. Uh, it seems to <laughs> Sounds be, like it's going to be. Uh, <laughs> it seems to be that we're talking about in the Trashy, where you are a, a, a one official and, and led yours to the list. Why do we have to bother with the Trashy? The text, you know, and, and together with modern scholarship, tells us a lot about it. First of all, we know that the Amorites, uh, what we call roughly the Amorites, we don't quite have the dates, you know, exactly, were moving in that direction. Haram is really the northern part of, uh, of, um, of what, I guess, the very northern edge of what became the Canaanite over it and why not. So that, that all begins to make sense. Abraham sure. included a lot of the, uh, of the Canaanite concepts. So it's e one of the things that, that I don't get is uh, it seems to be, you know, Midrash is, it, yeah, are all kinds of stories based on stuff that really has no, you know, may have an imaginative uh, validity, but I'm not going to hang my hat on No, I wouldn't want you to. And it's really a pleasure to, to encounter someone who's really as up on Middle Eastern history as you are. And, I, and I'm pleased to hear this. But so you, you actually answered your own question. It is, in fact, the imaginative quality. Midrash exists, essentially. And I love Midrash. I've spent most of my professional career playing with Midrash. Midrash exists because I like to tell people that you've got the black letters in the scroll, and then you've got the white spaces in between. Yeah. The midrash is the white spaces. And the best midrashim come to answer questions that start with why. And what archaeology and history cannot tell us, even though it can tell us why Avram and his mishpacha moved out of war because they are part of a general trend at that time. You're absolutely right, but it doesn't tell us why did God choose Abraham. Now, there are two strands in the tradition. One says that Abraham was intellectually precocious. He figured out that there was one God. I like that. It's okay. Abraham was a gifted child. The other is that Abraham was an iconoclast. So now we have this midrash. 
Rabbi Chia, the grandson of Rabbi Ada of Yafo, taught Terach was a maker of images. He was in the idol business. One day he went to another place and appointed Abraham to sell in Sedeva. A man came to him and wanted to buy an idol. Abraham asked him, what kind of god do you wish to buy? How old are you? The man answered, 50 or 60 years old. Abraham said, woe to a man who is that old, yet bows down before this thing which was made only today. The man was ashamed and left. By the way, there's just no way that Abraham is going to be winning the Salesman of the Year award <laughs> from the ancient Near Eastern Society of Idol Salesmen. Then an old woman came, carrying a bowl of fine flour, and said, Here, offer it to the gods. At that, Abraham seized the stick, smashed all the images, and placed the stick in the hand of the biggest of them. Now, by the way, how many of you know this, this part of the story that I just told you? That's really interesting, because most people don't know that first part. And I spent a lot of time in this book analyzing the first part. In fact, one of the things that I notice is, and maybe you've noticed this as well, the author of the Midrash could have located this idol smashing in a home or an ancient idolatrous temple. But instead, where does he locate this act of idol smashing? Where does it happen? In a market, in a store. And what I write about in this book is that this is one of the best examples of a Jewish critique of consumerism. The market as God. One of the things I point to in here is the story that makes us think of what others have said about consumerism. It's a scene that I always loved in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof in which Harvey Big Daddy Pollock is analyzing his wife's propensity for purchasing. The human animal is a beast that dies. And if he's got money, he buys and buys and buys. And I think the reason he buys everything he can buy is that in the back of his mind, he has the crazy hope that one of his purchases will be life everlasting, which it can never be. We live in a time now where we need a Jewish critique of consumerism. And what I found fascinating while doing the research for this book is how little we Jews have written that is a concrete critique of market values. Last week, two weeks ago, I wrote an essay in my blog. It was, actually wasn't in my blog, it was in the Jewish Week. And it was called, When Judaism Becomes Kmart. And I talked about synagogues that are forming mostly on Long Island, but I did not even mention the word Long Island, uh, that are really giving other synagogues a run for their money. Uh, they've decided uh, that there's almost no requirement for bar or bat mitzvah. Uh, they're they're, they're cheaper, than, cheaper than everyone else. And I, and I said, look, there's nothing wrong with starting another synagogue. But what I objected to was a consumer mentality in which we actually lower the demand for Judaism rather than going for something higher and, and bigger. You can add Lubavitch to the I didn't, I didn't even say the word. I know that you well, Lubavitch in that article was about as present as God is in the book of Esther, which is to say, not at all. But that's, some, sad, that's sad, because Lubavitch are, are one of the main people. In yeah, the don't get me started. Okay, so his father comes home. Terach comes home. And he said, who did this to the gods? Abraham answered, would I hide anything from my father? A woman came with a bowl of fine flour and said, here, offer it up to them. When I offered it, one god said, I will eat first, and another said, no, I will eat first. Then the biggest of them rose up and smashed all the others. His father replied, are you making sport of me? They cannot do anything. Abraham answered, you say they cannot. Let your ears hear what your mouth is saying. And that's the story that most of us know. But then it goes one step further. 
Because what happens is that Terah takes Abraham to King Nimrod. And Nimrod essentially puts him on trial for heresy. And then her, uh, Nimrod is going to throw Abraham into the midst of a fiery furnace. And you'll see Haran, Abraham's brother, was standing there split in his thinking. If Abraham is victorious, he thought, I will say that I am on Abraham's side. Should Nimrod win, I'll say that I'm on Nimrod's side. You got to admire a guy who's that principle. So after Abraham went down into the open fire and was saved, Haran was asked, whose side are you on? And he replied, Abraham's. He was immediately seized and thrown into the fire. His inward parts were burnt. He died in the presence of his father. As he said, Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah. And now you know the secret. The secret is that this entire legend was created with one purpose and one purpose only. It was created to explain how it was that Terah died al Panay, in literally in the face of his father, in the presence of his father. Haranda. Haranda. Haranda, right. Now, one of the things that I write about, and I'm going to be talking about it next Sunday, is that in some ways this explains Abraham's tortured relationship with his nephew Lot. Because Lot is an orphan. Haran has died. And Abraham has a love-hate relationship with Lot. I'm also going to talk about how the entire story of Abraham is filled with fire. In fact, the covenant that God makes with Abraham includes a vision of a torch and a smoking oven. And I think that what happened was that God showed him this story. There are layers and layers and layers to this particular story. But one of the things I want to say as we move forward here is as we move forward, the story is a very powerful one and it exists in at least one other religious tradition. By the way, if you look at your text, page two, number two, a quote from Joshua chapter 24, which is Joshua's speech to the Israelites as we enter the land of Israel. And Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, your ancestors lived of old beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan. And my friends, that is the only reference at all in the entire Bible to any idea that Abraham worshipped idols or that his father worshipped idols. In fact, there are almost no idols at all in the book of Genesis, with the exception of these little household idols, these teraphim that Rachel steals from her father, Laban, when she and Jacob and the family were kind of doing a dress rehearsal for the Exodus and getting out of his control. What do I mean when I say that this story shows up in other cultures? If you look to page, uh, text number three and text number four, you will see that the story appears almost verbatim in the Quran. And we are not surprised at this, because in fact, Islam is as militantly monotheistic and as fanatically monotheistic, one, if possible, even more so than Judaism. And then I've added a beautiful poem uh, by the Muslim Sufi mystic poet Rumi, I have carved idols enough to beguile every person. Now I am drunk with Abraham. I am sated with Azar, which is the name in his plum that is given to Terah. An idol without color and scent arrived. My hand was put out of action by him. Seek another master for the shop of idol making. I have cleared the shop of myself. I have thrown away the idols. Having realized the worth of madness, I have become free of thoughts. If an image enters my heart, I say, depart, you who lead astray. So I start peeling back this story, layer after layer after layer. Now, 
As Rabbi Schwartz said, my first book was Putting God on the Guest List, How to Reclaim the Spiritual Meaning of Your Child's Bar of Mitzvah. It came out in 1992. Occasionally I meet people who were bar mitzvahs, so to speak, under the influence of that book, and their own children are becoming bar mitzvah, which means, you know, if I can quote Bob Dylan again, I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. But it's amazing how these things happen. One of the things that I had forgotten was that when I was researching that book, I had forgotten that there's really not much evidence of bar mitzvah in the halakha, the legal literature of the Jewish people. It all seems to have emerged from the fact that Abraham was said to be 13 when he broke his father's idols. And that's a very powerful lesson. And I love teaching kids that. That a very important piece of maturation and of becoming your own person is to be able to break your father's idols. As a matter of fact, I would say that modern Judaism, certainly modern German Judaism, is the remnant of German Jews breaking their own father's idols and those were the idols of assimilation. I'll give you three examples. This Yom Kippur, we mark the 100th anniversary of the return to Judaism of Franz Rosenzweig, who rejected his parents' assimilation and was almost ready to become a Christian, and he decided not to. We can take in another example, Gershom Scholl, the father of scholarship in Jewish mysticism. Gershom Scholl came from a very assimilated German-Jewish family. So much so that, well, this is good news and bad news. He was a Zionist from a young age, and his parents gave him a gift of a portrait of Theodor Herzl. That's the good news. The bad news was that they gave it to him for Christmas. <laughs> his family was so estranged from Judaism that his father would light a cigar from the Shabbat candles and would say, Baruch HaTad Benayi tobacco. Mocking Judaism. And then the third example from the German Jewish cultural milieu is that of Franz Kafka, who in a very famous letter to his father castigated his father for not caring at all about Judaism, but only going to synagogue so that he could be seen with the right people. And so this notion of shattering idols continues and moves forward. That's why I actually included a poem by Delmore Schwartz, the great American Jewish poet, who, by the way, was the subject in a disguised form of Saul Bellow's novel, Humboldt's Gift. I was a mere boy in a stonecutter's shop when early one evening my raised hand was halted and the soundless voice said, depart from your father and your country and the things to which you are accustomed. Go now into a country unknown and strange. I will make of your children a great nation your generations will haunt every generation of all the nations. They will be like the stars at midnight, like the sand of the sea. Then I looked up at the infinite sky, star pointing and silent, and it was then on that evening that I became a man, that evening of my manhood's birthday. And so it is that Abraham becomes a man, so to speak, a Jewish man, as it were, by shattering his father's idols. Now, we can spend a lot of time just dealing with the religious implications of this, but one of the things I want to point you to is that in the Pew study that recently came out, we came to an understanding of how many people connect to Judaism in a cultural sense. In fact, we might have been amused to discover how many people connect being Jewish with having a sense of humor. I think that this notion of iconoclasm of breaking idols is so huge that it permeates all of Western culture and it permeates even the lives of secular Jews. What's amazing to me is if you look at modernity, modernity really is the child of several thinkers who had different kinds of relationships with Judaism and with the Jewish people but who were eager and able to smash the idols of their time. 
I'm thinking of Karl Marx. I'm thinking of Sigmund Freud. I'm thinking of Albert Einstein. In other words, people who completely redid our way of understanding the state, the inner life, the universe. I would even go so far as to say that if you look at Jewish comedy, one of the things that distinguishes Jewish comedy from all other forms of comedy is its absolute iconoclastic nature. Starting in our time with the late lamented Lenny Bruce, who was considered obscene, now would be considered rather tame, going through to Woody Allen, to Philip Roth, who still hasn't won the Nobel Prize for Literature, going all the way to Sarah Silverman. As a matter of fact, Sarah Silverman takes this story and it, she makes this one of the most influential stories in her life. She said, you can be sure that even though Abraham's father didn't like it when he broke the idols, his mother bragged about it to everyone. <laughs> she says that that's me. I'm the guy who shattered the idols. The second to last thing I want to say and I do hope that you will feel free to interrupt and ask questions and to join this conversation, is that in one of the most troubling chapters that I wrote, and I think it's the chapter that is the most controversial, I actually look at anti-Semitism. And I come up with an idea that is not mine, but is, I think, one of the most subtle and I think one of the most powerful, if not explanations for anti-Semitism, then certainly an interpretation of anti-Semitism. And it is simply this. As a people that shatters idols, we not only shattered our own idols, but we shattered others. We have always had the courage to stand apart from the cultures in which we've lived. We've known what to take, and we've known what to reject. As a matter of fact, if you look at ancient history, the only people that rebel against the cultural mores of the Greek and Roman world was in fact the Jews. We were unique in that. And so I'm going to now argue, and it's a touchy, difficult subject, that one reason for anti-Semitism is that we Jews had the monumental chutzpah and audacity to put forth an ideal and to stick to that ideal. A number of people have noticed that in some ways Christian anti-Semitism is a bizarre displacement upon the Jews of a hidden resentment against Jesus. That European Christians are, five, six, seven, eight generations ago, actually pagans. And there is something in the European mind that craves paganism and despises Christianity because it had the temerity to force us, to force them to curb their appetites. No one has written about this with as much power as George Steiner. George Steiner is a world-class philosopher. He's also, by the way, an anti-Zionist. No, he's a non-Zionist, not out of something called self-hatred. He's a non-Zionist because he really believes that it's the role of the Jew to be homeless in the world, to be a moral irritant. And if we're locked into a territory, we're just not going to have the opportunity to do that. Interesting. I don't accept it, but it's interesting. Steiner, in 1981, wrote a novel called the Portage to San Cristobal of A.H. This is what happens when a philosopher chooses to write a thriller. 
It was God awful. There's only one thing in the book worth reading, and those are the final three pages. What happens in the book? Steiner imagines that Hitler is alive and well and living in South America. And as Eichmann was before him, he is kidnapped by Israeli agents and he's brought to trial in Jerusalem. And then Steiner actually has the chutzpah to imagine that Hitler takes the stand in his own defense. He actually gives the speech that Hitler would have given. And he says that Hitler says that he had to do what he did because the Jews invented not only conscience, which was bad enough, but the Jew invented God. Was there ever a crueler invention, a contrivance more calculated to harrow human existence than that of an omnipotent, all-seeing, yet invisible, impalatable, inconceivable God? The Jew invented conscience and left man a guilty serf. Now, Steiner's not alone. The late uh, Father Edward Flannery, in his book, The Anguish of the Jews, actually believes uh, that the Jew was seen as the incarnation of Jesus, and therefore the Christian mind, as I said moments ago, not being able to handle this moral burden, and yet not being able psychologically to strike at it against Jesus, this would not be kosher, took out the pain on the people of Jesus. Now, you're free to accept or reject this. But I want to say that I think there's some truth in it. I think that there is some animus in the world towards the Jews that can be laid at the feet of the fact that we are incorrigible idealists. As a matter of fact, Paul Johnson, in the final paragraph of his history of the Jews, actually comes out and says, that this was the great thing about the Jews. The Jews believed themselves created and commanded to be a light to the Gentiles, and they have obeyed to the best of their considerable powers. The Jews gave the world ethical monotheism, which might be described as the application of reason to divinity. In a more secular age, they applied the principles of rationality to the whole range of human activities, often in, in advance of the rest of mankind, the light they thus shed disturbed as well as illuminated, for it revealed painful truths about the human spirit as well as the means to uplift it. The Jews have been great truth-tellers, and that is one reason they have been so much hated. The last thing I want to say, and we can open this up, and I've been thinking about this, If, in fact, we Jews are known for our iconoclasm, our ability to stand against the idols of every age, we have to ask ourselves, what are the contemporary idols in our world that need shattering? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to place that before you. I will say uh, that I did list in the last chapter a number of Jewish idols that still need to be shattered, to wit, the absolute adherence to halakha, to Jewish law, or for that matter, the absolute adherence to ritual and with no attention being paid to the inner life. You know, Heschel wrote, and by the way, what's interesting to me, is as we speak, the centennial convention of the United Synagogue, the conservative movement, is taking place. And they're saying to themselves, if you don't mind my using a little Yiddish here, that we are in gehaftet source. I hope I don't have to translate. You know, they, they are proud of the fact that they have 1,100 people coming to their convention. Usually they get 400. If you've ever been to a URJ biennial, uh, we, get, we get four times that amount. I'm not saying that we should be haughty and arrogant because of that. We've got our own issues and our own challenges. But Heschel wrote 
his critiques of the lack of kavanah in the American synagogue in the 1950s, and he was explicitly critiquing not reform synagogues, but what happened in conservative synagogues. When he talks about how our services are dull and lifeless, the modern temple suffers from a severe cold. The last thing I want to say is perhaps the most dangerous. And it's simply this. I think we all sense and the Pew Center study made this clear to us if we hadn't thought about it in the past. That as much as we love and cherish the institution of the synagogue, it is absolutely necessary for us moving forward to constantly reevaluate what synagogue life should look like and be like and what it should evoke. I don't know about you. My kids, who are now in their 20s, one of whom is, in fact, a member of a synagogue in Washington, D.C., and whose bride-to-be is joining the Jewish people. We're very happy about that. If you talk to your kids and your grandchildren, they will offer their own criticisms of what synagogue life can be like. And we may need new kinds of institutions I was talking to someone today about how so many modern Jews love culture, and I said, you know, we should be bringing culture, popular culture, into the synagogue. We can be creating ways in which we use cinema for sermonic purposes. And I envision a synagogue, congregation Beit Kol Noah, a congregation house of film. I'm saying that if we don't play with these images, if we don't play with our institutions and, and constantly work on them, they will become lifeless idols. Now, before I throw the floor I'll open to questions, I want to tell you a story about Mrs. Goldberg. You know, I, I came from Columbus, Georgia. I was living in Georgia for 10 years. And then my wife got a major promotion in her company. And so we moved up here uh, to New Jersey. And that's where I do my rabbinic stuff. But when I lived in Columbus, Georgia, I lived very close to the largest military installation in the country, which is Fort Benning, Georgia. Well, Mrs. Goldberg's son was graduating from Officer Candidate School, and she wanted to go down, go to the final exercise to see him get his uniform and to be assigned his rank. So Mrs. Goldberg takes all of her friends, and they go on a bus from the Bronx down to Columbus, Georgia. There they are on the parade grounds, and she's watching. The entire squadron is marching to the left, and her son, Herman, is marching to the right. And she says to her friends, look at this, such an office. My son is the only one who's doing it right. <laughs> Friends, sometimes it feels as if everyone is marching one way and we're marching in the other. But I base my faith and my teaching on the fact that 99% of the time, we're doing it right. I thank you very much. So let's, uh, your, your questions and your comments on what we've done. Yes, sir. You mentioned the term Kavada. How would you define spirituality? <laughs> oh my goodness me, I couldn't have planted you better. I feel a little guilty of this. Because several of my books have the word spiritual or spirituality in the title. And I think what I'd like to do is I would like to ordain a 20-year ban on the use of the term until we figure it out. I prefer kavana, that sense of inward connection and inward feeling, which flies in the face of simply doing it by rote. You know, when I reflected on the fact that Judaism, a religion and a religious culture that is founded on continuity, begins with an act of discontinuity. 
with Abraham breaking his father's idols, I quote from Ryan Buber, religiosity, and I put in brackets, which we might translate as the current term spirituality, starts anew with every young person, shaping to his very mystery. Religion, the established faith and its systems, wants to force him into a system stabilized for all time. Religiosity means activity, the elemental entering into relation with the absolute. Religion means passivity, an acceptance of the handed down command. Religiosity induces sons who want to find their own God to rebel against their fathers. Religion induces fathers to reject their sons who will not let their father's God be forced upon them. Religiosity, the active creative impulse, religion, according to Buber, that dead thing that we simply enshrine. Yes, sir? Why do you think it is that the story is pivotal, as it's obviously is, the story of the Jericho Bibles? Why is it related in the Medrash rather than the Bible? This gentleman asks a really interesting question. If this story is so pivotal, why is it in the Midrash and not in the Bible itself? Now I'm going to give you a coming attraction of what I'm going to do next Sunday. And I hope that you'll all be there. Because we're going to have a lot of fun. By the way, I, I think being a rabbi, being a Jewish teacher, and doing this stuff is the most fun anyone can I once asked a child, what's the difference between fun and joy? And this kid was a gifted Jewish child, but that's redundant. Uh, <laughs> you know, we all know the Yiddish word for average is gifted. Uh, he said to me, Rabbi, that's easy. Fun you have and it's over. Joy you have and it lasts forever. But I think, I think this stuff is fun and joyful. One of the things I'm going to teach that Sunday is actually a response to your question. If this story is so good, why is it in the Midrash and not in the Bible itself? Let me give you the official answer. As James Kugel will tell you, with a commercial there, <laughs> almost as soon as the texts of the Bible, certainly the Torah, were canonized, people started asking why questions. And the why questions become the Midrash. Because if you've ever noticed this, the Torah and the Bible itself is very sparse on detail. There's almost no description. Almost no reasons are given for anything for people's <laughs> actions, right? Contrast that, as Eric Auerbach does, with the lengthy description of the scar on Odysseus's foot, which is a Greek way of telling the story. The Torah is, when it comes to details, pretty shot. So that's the official answer. But now I'm going to give you a playful answer that I think I got from the greatest biblical scholar of our time who spoke here recently, and that's Aviva Gottlieb Zorkler. I think I got this from her. What if, what if the stuff in the Midrash really happened? And yet, it was censored, either deliberately or the kind of thought censorship that we all do as part of our lives. What if the Midrash was the remembered piece of the dream? What if the Midrash was that thing you say to the therapist when you're walking out of the office? You know, there's one last thing I wanted to mention, which is really the reason why you came in the first place. So. Next Sunday, week from Sunday, I'm going to imagine that this Midrash really happened. And it was censored. And that was the primal trauma of the Jewish people. To wit, what does it mean for Terah to look at the death of his son? And how has that reverberated through the generations? Oh, boy, yes. Um, I have a question about uh, contemporary. Go ahead. American culture is 
permeated by unexamined, intense, and enthusiastic consumerism. Yes. And how were Jews ever, I don't see Jews being any, any more exempt than anybody else. And your, your, your question would be? Would be, will the assimilation of the Jews be in fact caused by this unexamined? It's a very interesting question. Welcome, Mr. Fletcher. I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> the, uh, uh, our friend asks the question, uh, if you look at the unabated consumerism of Jews and our participation in this aspect of American culture, is this yet another form of assimilation and will this be dangerous to the Jewish people? Did I, did I get that pretty right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me say something. I say over and over again in this book that one of the great things about Jews is that we were always able to stand apart from society in key ways. We had this intuitive sense of what to take in and what to leave out. And when I talk about the glory of classical reform Judaism, and I'm not just pandering uh, to the fact that I'm, we're in one of the citadels of that, to me, one of the great things about reform Judaism was its utter reliance on what we sometimes call the prophetic tradition. Now, one of the aspects of the prophetic tradition that we backburnered to our peril is simply this. I think when people talk about prophetic Judaism, they imagine that Isaiah and Amos and Hosea were slightly left of center Democrats. <laughs> I think we missed the point. The real point of the prophets, and Heschel writes about this, is that the prophets had an iconoclastic spirit and they were unafraid to speak out against the injustices and the pettiness of society. Frederick Buechner, the great Christian writer, once said, and I've quoted this all over, all over the place, and I'll, I'll do so in the work that we're working on now, there is no evidence of a prophet being invited back a second time for dinner. <laughs> the prophets were the killjoys. Now, to the extent that we have lost that mojo, if I may use that term, then we've lost a valuable piece of who we are and Paradoxically, what the world wants. A number of years ago, my uh, good friend uh, Dick Burnett, who's a, an Episcopalian rector in Columbus, Ohio, took me to visit Leander Keck, who was a professor of New Testament at the Yale Divinity School, and wrote one of the finest biographies of Jesus and interpretations of Jesus' life I've ever read. So I'm sitting there with Professor Keck, and he says to me over coffee, so Dick tells me you're a rabbi. Mm -hmm. I said, I am. And he says the following, I have always admired the ability of the Jewish people to stand out against the crowd and not simply blend into the mass of undifferentiated humanity. What a blessing that was. And then I write about Stanley Hauerwas and William Willimon, who in their book, Resident Aliens, these are two Christian theologians, they're visiting a rabbi in the South, they're having Shabbat dinner, and the, the rabbi's kids are acting up. And the rabbi says to the kids, what you're doing might be okay for everyone else, but it's not okay for you. You are Jews, and you have a different story, and you must act differently. And Hauerwas and Willeman leave the house, and they turn to each other, and they say, that's what we Christians lack. We should have a way of acting so that our story is evoked in what we do. So what I'm telling you is that sincere, thoughtful Christians who love the Jewish people actually admire our ability to stand above and beyond. Now, let's be very clear. Let's be very clear. Too much of that, and you wind up on the L train to Borough Park. Right? Too little of that, and you wind up changing your name and converting just so you can get into a fancy country club. There has to be some kind of tension there. 
most of us would like to be somewhere on that continuum. We Jews are not the Amish. But if we simply melt into the rest of humanity, then we'll lose our ability to say anything to the world as Jews. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to you, but I want to make sure I hold on. People haven't spoken here. Yes, sir. That's a question. You, you mentioned that the importance to the word Kavanah. And <coughs> the root of the word Kavanah is Kibun or direction. Yes. And Kavanah doesn't occur ex nihilo out of nothing. It comes from a direction. And there's the, the antidote for consumerism is a movement towards ritual among all of the denominations of Judaism, from the HUC having kosher meals to the whole Upper West Side, which you come in and then you're in the Jewish week, uh, you got and, and it seems like people are grabbing at ritual to sort of refocus them. And again, as almost the antidote of consumerism. And I just wonder what your, your thoughts are, because I, I get a sense you don't like this sort of religious shift going on. Which religious shift? I mean, the, the ritual shift going on. I know, quite the, quite the opposite. Uh, it's, it's, it's beyond the topic right now, but I think that the return to ritual on the part of many contemporary Jews, which, by the way, is the story that's not being told in the Pew Report, is based on a number of things. But most powerfully, it's based on a critique of consumer society. The hunger for community is based on people's desire not to live in a world just filled with the shopping mall. A number of years ago, I had a letter in the New York Times. They done a series about Alpharetta, Georgia, which is a suburb north of uh, Atlanta, not far from where we used to live. And, uh, Alpharetta, like many places in America, is stricken with what I would call anonotopia. It's one of my favorite words. Anonotopia. Definition, <laughs> being in a place where you get the sense that you could be anywhere. Right? You all know what I mean. Right? And the article talked about people who spend all day in the car, and there are no sidewalks. And there's no downtown. There's no there there. And I wrote a letter and I said, and this partially explains the growth of the megachurches. That the megachurches find homes in these kind of communities, these kinds of communities, says that people are really hungering to feel a sense of connectedness, community. of community. And community is interesting because it's one of the great misused words of our time, I think. Community is not merely my friend. It's living in the midst of people who share your values. You know, when my father's Aunt Amy died, I love telling this story, my father loved to say that Amy was 90. Uh, we made, uh, made a shiva call, and the door opens, and a bunch of people walk in, and this 13-year-old boy, 14 maybe, goes over to my great uncle, Harry, and he says, may God console you, may God comfort you on your loss. He opens the sidur, leads the evening service, okay, goes into the dining room, gets a fistful of ragalah, <laughs> shoves them in his pocket, collects the siduri, goes over to my great uncle and says, may God comfort you, and leaves because it's a school night. So I turn to my uncle Harry, who has since gone up to his final rest, and I said, Uncle Harry, who was that pastor? Who, who was that kid? And this is how Harry answered. And this was one of the most powerful moments of my Jewish education. A kid from the shul. And that is really amazing. It would have been nice if he knew the kid's name, right? But he identified this child in his role and in his context. And you got to hand it to the Jewish educator who said to that kid and to other kids, 
Now that you're bar mitzvah, footnote and bottom of the page, old enough to do mitzvah, we're going to teach you the most delicate and most powerful mitzvah of all. We're going to teach you how to conquer your own fear of death and your fear of grief, and we're going to teach you how to do a shiva menu. Wow. That's called Jewish education. People are looking for a sense of community where their values mean something. When Hillary Clinton wrote, you know, it takes a village, she was right. Anna Quinlan said that when her father was growing up in Hoboken, uh, that, uh, when, uh, that within eight square blocks there were five people who had, the, uh, had permission to hit him. You know, we could, we could argue about that, but in other words, the nun, the cop, the sh everyone was in loco parentis, translation crazy like a parent. <laughs> it took a village. Okay, let's take a couple of, uh, a couple of more. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you know, just following up on what you said, uh, a number of years ago, we were at, we attended a sort of brunch at a Presbyterian church on Long Island where the, that shared space or had rent, not shared, but rented its space basically to a synagogue, to a reform synagogue. And there were members of both congregations just eating together and talking, comparing their experiences. And what one of the Presbyterian ministers was most impressed by, and he said this, was that when asked, when we went around the room asking people why they were there, why they had joined the congregation, the Jewish people almost uniformly said, as one of their reasons, to be part of the, a Jewish community. And the, the Presbyterian minister said, why can't we feel like that? <laughs> because they are a majority. No, it's actually, it's, it's, bigger, it's bigger and deeper than that, and uh, this will probably end. And by the way, commercial, uh, I do hope that you'll both read and buy The Gods of Broken, The Hidden Legacy of Abraham, uh, and I hope that I've whetted your appetite uh, sufficiently this evening so that you'll want to journey through this tale as I have, because I've only just begun to really scrape uh, the tip of the iceberg. And by the way, Hanukkah is very early this year. Very it early. makes a great Hanukkah gift. It's in, or you can read it very freely. Or a Halloween gift. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Think about how you will change the world if you give this to kids coming by the home. I want to respond to what you said. You know, it's like the country mouse and the city mouse. We Jews look at Christians and we say, gosh, we admire your faith and your ability to believe. And Christians look at us and they say, we admire your sense of community and we admire your sense of people. But that's what Christians don't have. Christians have a faith and many Christians have an ethnicity. But there really is no such thing as the Christian people. Why do they need it? What's that? Why do they need it? Ours is it. Is it, is it. I think a situation, moral, I mean, I can't speak for everything that ever happened in the world, but uh, basically uh, uh, by itself. And uh, we've always suffered from this, uh, of this confusion as to exactly what we are, whether we're people, we are religion, we are, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to tell you. And they don't have to worry about it because they don't worry about it. Well, it's, what's, what's interesting to me is this. And I'll, every attempt to sever peoplehood from religion in, in the last 200 years of Jewish history has been an utter failure. Uh, and what, I think what many Christians want, I can't speak for them, that would be, as I've said, chutzpah, is they do want a real sense of, 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 horizontal, of horizontal connection. They like the fact that you can't be a Jew alone. Uh, someone recently asked me, I'll end on this note, why a minion? Why do you need 10 Jews to pray with And I thought about it. First I thought maybe it was because Abraham, next week, tries to bargain God down to 10 people, 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, he lost that fight. And I thought maybe it was 10 for uh, the 10 spies who brought back negative reports uh, when they went to scout out the land. But why would we attach a minion to that? And I learned something from the great uh, modern Hasidic Rebbe, Zalman Shachter Shalomi. 
Reb Solomon reminds us that in Kabbalah, in mysticism, there are ten aspects of God's personality, the spherot, ten ways that God's presence enters the world. He goes one step further, and this is, this is gorgeous. And he says, we need a minion because each person who comes embodies a different aspect of God. And unless we have at least ten people, God, as it were, is incomplete. It turns out that we not only need God, God, in a sublime way, needs us as well. Thank you so much for being here.